So the last uh, last speaker today uh, is uh, Dr. Ura from IBM a Research Lab. Uh, he graduated 2007 at MIT, and uh, so he's actually our neighbors. And so we are very happy he can come to give us talk today. Thanks. So thanks for inviting me and staying around. Um, the title of this talk is Input Sparsity and Hardness for Robust Subspace Approximation. Um, and this is uh, work with uh, Ken Clarkson. So I'm going to talk about ways uh, for compressing your data set, viewed as a matrix, which are different than the standard uh, singular value decomposition that you might be used to. Um, they're more robust in a certain sense. So let me just review the singular value decomposition. So you're given an n by d matrix A. Think of this as maybe n examples in Rd. So the rows A1 through An are d-dimensional. And you want to find a typically low-dimensional uh, subspace V, um, k-dimensional, which minimizes the sum of squares of distances of your points, AI, to this space, OK? Um, and uh, I'm going to abuse notation throughout the talk. So I'm going to use this V both for the k-dimensional subspace. And also, I'll think of it as a d by k matrix uh, with orthonormal columns, OK? So in that sense, VV transpose is the projection onto the space V. And so what I'm doing is looking at the sum of squares of distances um, uh, from AI to uh, AI VV transpose. <clears throat> so the optimal V is given by the top K right singular vectors of A, or the top K principal components. And naively, uh, using the singular value decomposition, you can compute this best k-dimensional space, this minimizing k-dimensional space, in the minimum of n squared d and n d squared arithmetic operations. And using fast matrix multiplication, in theory, you can do better. Um, but you can do significantly better if you allow uh, both randomization and approximation. So suppose you're content with outputting a k-dimensional space v prime, um, which has the following property the sum of square distances of your points to v prime is at most 1 plus epsilon times the uh, best possible uh, cost. So if you allow this uh, with high probability, if you allow this, then you can compute v prime in time, which is only order n and z of a, where n and z of a means the number of non-zero entries of your matrix a, which, you know, even if a is dense, this is at most n d, which is still improving upon uh, the singular value decomposition. But in many applications, A is actually sparse, right? It might only have a constant number of entries, uh, non-zero entries in each example. And then this would be order n. Uh, plus a term, which is typically low order, n plus d times poly k of epsilon. Um, so this was in joint work uh, with Ken a few years ago. And see also uh, work by Meng Mahoney, Jelani, and uh, Nguyen, and Borgain, uh, Dorksen, and, and Nguyen for further optimizations to this poly k of epsilon uh, factor. OK, so um, in robust statistics, uh, sort of the message is that for many problems, the sum of square distances is too sensitive to outliers. So suppose you have some corrupted example, uh, which is very far from a good uh, subspace fitting the remaining points. Then since you're squaring distances, you're really going to try to fit that example. OK, so sort of squaring distances is sometimes too sensitive to outliers. Um, for other problems, such as the classical regression problem, um, recall in the regression problem, uh, you're given an n by d matrix A. Uh, typically, the rows are examples, and n by 1 vector B of observations. And you're trying to find a vector x in Rd, which minimizes the distance between Ax and B. OK, and what is the distance? Well, people often study, I mean, you, you can study the Euclidean distance. This is least squares. But people often study more robust norms. So one example is that people study the, um, uh, the L1 distance between Ax and B. OK, just the sum of absolute values of Ax, what you predict, the difference between Ax and, and, and the corresponding coordinate of B. So you know, in some sense, you're summing distances as, opposing, as opposed to summing square distances. And moreover, sometimes people don't even look at norms. Um, you can just define a general function. 
Uh, in statistics, people often look at what are called M estimators. So here, it's the sum over examples i of some M function applied to the difference between ax and b on the ith coordinate. OK? Um, what is an interesting example of an M estimator? So one that's well studied is called the Huber uh, estimator, which has the following property. So here's a, a picture of it. So it looks quadratic near the origin. And as you move away from the origin, at some point, specified by a threshold, it becomes linear. Now, why would you want this? Oh, OK, so, and it's defined in a smooth way. So you have this threshold tau. It's quadratic before that, and then it becomes linear. Why would you want this? Well, uh, in optimization problems, you often want smoothness. And one nice property about this is it's differentiable at the origin. So it has smoothness properties of L2 squared, but it also has robustness properties of L1. As you move away from the origin, you know, as you're sort of more and more outlying, you, you have this uh, linear robustness property, which is what you want. OK, so, um, and for this, uh, for regression, you can compute uh, very quickly uh, a 1 plus epsilon approximation, a relative error approximation in time, which is uh, number of non-zero entries of A plus uh, poly D over epsilon. Typically in regression, uh, this uh, n by d matrix in over-constrained regression, the d is much smaller than, than n, and this is an acceptable uh, running time. Um, you can also generalize this to a wide class of what I call nice m estimators, and I'll discuss uh, more of these uh, later in the talk. OK, so we see that robust uh, statistics has met uh, regression. What about robust forms of low rank approximation? OK. So first of all, what, what would be an, uh, a good cost measure? So what is one property that you might want? So one is basis independence. So you might want it to be the case that if you take your points in RD and you rotate them, that the cost function is preserved. OK, so this sort of says that the cost function depends on the geometry of the points. All the distances will be preserved. And, and you, you don't want it to depend on the particular basis. Um, so this does rule out some forms of uh, approximation. For instance, you know, one natural robust form of approximation would be to approximate your matrix A by a low rank matrix B, which minimizes the sum of L1 distances between the rows of A and B. OK, this, this seems uh, fairly natural. Um, but this does not satisfy this basis independence uh, assumption. I mean, for instance, if B is rank 0 is just the 0 matrix, then the cost is the entry-wise 1 norm of A. And if I rotate the points, I, I destroy the 1 norm. OK. So given this property, what is a natural uh, way of uh, a cost function for robust uh, low rank approximation? OK, so something very natural, and it's been well studied, is instead of taking the sum of distances to this minimizing space, I take the sum of p powers of the distances to this minimizing space for some parameter p. OK? In fact, when p equals 1, this is just the sum of distances to the space, which could arguably be, be thought of as being even more natural than the singular value decomposition. Um, so, uh, right, so it's just this, the same thing as before, except now I'm taking the sum of p powers. Um, so this is rotationally invariant, right? When I rotate by uh, some rotation matrix, all the distances are preserved. So in particular, the sum of p powers of distances is preserved. And for p less than 2, this is more robust in the sense that I described than the SVD. OK? Any questions about this? OK. So, so what is known about these kinds of cost functions? So just some notation, I'll say a k-dimensional space v prime is a 1 plus epsilon approximation if the sum of p powers of distances with respect to it is at most 1 plus epsilon times the minimum possible uh, uh, cost solution. So for constant p between 1 and infinity, um, what Shraddha Kumar and Vedarajan showed is that you can output a k-dimensional space v prime, which is a 1 plus epsilon approximation, 
in this time. So the time is n times d, so it's an n by d matrix, times a polynomial in k over epsilon, plus an exponential term in a polynomial in k over epsilon. OK? So if, if poly, poly k over epsilon is, say, most log n, this is reasonable. This could be polynomial time. Um, if you don't like this exponential term, uh, one way of getting around it is uh, via the definition of a weak corset. So a weak corset relaxes the dimension of the space uh, that, that you find. So instead of finding a k-dimensional k space, if you allow yourself to output a poly k of epsilon dimensional space, v prime, where you're just guaranteed that it contains some good k-dimensional space, some 1 plus epsilon approximation, then you can do this in nd poly k of epsilon time. OK, you got rid of this exponential uh, term. And the problem is we just don't know how to find this k-dimensional space inside of uh, this larger space uh, quickly. OK, so this was realized by Deshpan and Badarajan. Feldman Langbird had has some significant improvements to this. Um, so I'm going to focus on p between 1 and 2 for robustness issues, but there are some results for p greater than 2. Um, in fact, there's a hardness result. So um, uh, the problem is, so um, uh, it's known that the problem is np hard to approximate up to a fixed constant factor for p greater than 2. OK, the constant is gamma sub p, which is the pth moment of a standard normal random variable. Um, so it was originally shown to be unique games hard by um, Deshpan et al. And Gurusram et al. were able to show this is np hard. Um, and interestingly, uh, there's a matching, uh, almost matching uh, polynomial time algorithm. So it achieves root 2 gamma p approximation um, in the same uh, paper. OK, so this is the previous work on, on this problem. Um, and there are many open questions from this work. Um, so in this talk, we're mostly interested in p between 1 and 2. And the first natural question is, so there's an exponential term in all of these uh, running times. OK, there's, it's nd poly k over epsilon plus exponential in poly k over epsilon. And the first natural question is, uh, is there a, an algorithm that's polynomial in all of the parameters? So this is not known for p less than 2. And, and moreover, the, the hardness proofs for p greater than 2, they, they, they critically break for p less than 2. Um, I, I can say more about that later. Another natural question is, what about input sparsity time? Can we achieve a leading order term of the form n and z of a, just like we could for uh, the singular value decomposition for p equals 2. Another natural question is, what about the many loss functions that are considered for regression? For example, the m estimators. Suppose we take the minimum, the k-dimensional space v, which minimizes the sum of m applied to the distances. Can one obtain any algorithm for low rank approximation for m estimators? I want to mention that m estimators are not very well behaved. Like, for one thing, is they're not scale invariant. So norms are scale invariant. These are not, and this causes a lot of problems. I mean, you remember this Huber m estimator is very not scale invariant. OK, so um, let me mention the contributions uh, of this work. So the first contribution uh, is the first hardness for this problem. Um, so we show for p uh, in the closed interval 1, open interval 2, uh, that the problem is uh, np hard to obtain a 1 plus 1 over d approximation. OK. It, um, so, uh, yeah, so before, nothing was known about this problem, um, uh, even the exact uh, solution. And um, so one thing that this implies is that there is no polynomial time algorithm in all of the parameters unless p equals np. And to put this in perspective, one thing that's interesting about this is that uh, together with previous work for p greater than 2, 
This shows actually that there's a singularity at p equals 2. OK? That um, unless p equals 2, the problem is np hard, or p very close to 2. Um, and I should mention a, you know, a, an open question that might have come to mind by looking at this is, we don't know if the problem is still np hard for fixed uh, constant epsilon. OK? We just know for 1 plus 1 over d approximation. OK. Um, the next contribution is an input sparsity time algorithm. So uh, for p between 1 and 2, we achieve an algorithm running in n and z of a plus n plus d poly k over epsilon plus exponential and poly k over epsilon. OK? So um, I think I mentioned n and z of a time is necessary to achieve relative error. Um, and so this is optimal. You know, provided k and epsilon are not too large. And again, if you don't like uh, this exponential term, which is in, in, some sense, in some form necessary given the hardness, one way of getting around it is again uh, by going through uh, weak core sets. So what we can do is we can find instead a poly k over epsilon dimensional subspace v prime, which contains a k dimensional subspace v double prime, which is a 1 plus epsilon approximation. And so now you can allow uh, k and epsilon to be, k over epsilon to be much larger. And uh, we get a running time which is n and z of a plus n plus d poly k over epsilon. Okay? Okay. Um, the next thing uh, that we show is uh, the first uh, theoretical results for low rank approximation for um, M estimators, for a wide class of uh, functions on the distances other than norms. OK, so there were some previous empirical results uh, by Ding et al. The M estimators that we can handle, I'll call uh, nice M, M estimators. They have uh, the following properties. So first of all, M needs to be an even function. M of 0 is 0. It needs to be monotonic. So m of a is greater than m of b for absolute value of a greater than absolute value of b. Um, and it needs to be uh, polynomially bounded. OK, so let me say uh, what this means. So um, well, basically, the ratio, if, if, if a is greater than b, the ratio of m a to m b is at least a over b up to a constant factor that depends on the m function. And at most, a over b uh, squared. So I've written a over b squared here um, just because I'm talking about robust uh, uh, measures. This actually does generalize to a over b to the q for a fixed uh, uh, in, uh, uh, constant q. Um, so polynomially bounded, you know, does, does, does this make any sense? Um, so uh, you know, this does capture the M estimators I talked about. The Huber estimator fits into this. L1, L2 squared fit into this. Um, any convex M estimator does have at least uh, linear growth. You often want convex M estimators because uh, you end up doing convex optimization at some point in the algorithm. Um, we also need it. This is the last condition to be square root subadditive. Um, so M A. M of a to the 1 half plus M of b to the 1 half is at least M of a plus b to the 1 half. Um, this is also satisfied by the, uh, uh, the example uh, M estimators that I talked about. OK, so for nice M estimators, um, what we show is not uh, nearly as clean or uh, you know, um, optimal as, as for norms. Um, so there are some very interesting open questions here. Um, so what we have is a general statement, uh, which I'll then instantiate uh, with in two particular ways. The general statement is we take this instance of low rank approximation for M estimators, and we reduce it to a very small problem, which is a different problem. Um, but uh, it's small, so the hope is you can do something there. And for some M estimators, you can. So let me just say uh, what this is. So Fix a parameter L, which is log n to the order log k. Think of this as something reasonably small. 
We can reduce low rank approximation with M estimator loss to the following problem. It's the min over matrices X with rank K of the sum over uh, coordinates I of the M function applied to the ith row of a matrix A hat times X times B minus the ith row of a matrix C, this Euclidean norm. And let me just say, you know, wh what is this? What's happening here? So there are three matrices, A hat, B, and C, and they're all really small. OK, Th these, are, these are tiny matrices. And what we're doing is we have some constrained form of um, uh, low rank approximation here. And so this, th the number of i that you sum over is the number of rows of A hat, which is small. So before it was n in the original problem, we've reduced it to something small. The number of columns is the number of columns of B, which is also small. So it's some small constrained version of uh, you know, M, -M, M estimator low rank approximation. And we can reduce it to this problem in near input sparsity time. OK, N and Z of A log N. OK, but we don't know how to solve this in general. Um, so two things we can do. Uh, the first thing is, suppose you allow large approximation. So instead of 1 plus epsilon approximation, um, you allow a factor L approximation. So log N to the order log K. Then we can, um, and, uh, now we can't even find a K dimensional space which has this approximation, but we can find a poly K log N dimensional space which has this approximation. Okay, so it's sort of by criteria in both, so the dimension is larger and the approximation is larger. Um, in input sparsity time, if you uh, allow the dimension to be a little bit larger, poly L over epsilon, then you can actually get this weak course that, that I've been saying multiple times. So you, you get a, a space that contains a k-dimensional space, which is a 1 plus epsilon approximation. OK, so both of these are input sparsity time. Um, and right, as I mentioned, the natural open question here is to improve upon these, um, to avoid a factor L approximation or this uh, weak core set guarantee. Um, but yeah, as far as we're aware, these are the first uh, results for low rank approximation um, uh, for uh, functions other than norms. And uh, there are some things that can be done. So there are empirical results uh, that have interesting heuristics that can be applied um, to this general problem. Um, but uh, OK. So um, right. So in the remainder of the talk, let me uh, uh, give some uh, intuition uh, for our algorithm when uh, p equals 1. And unfortunately, I don't have enough time to get into uh, either the hardness or extensions of the algorithm to uh, uh, more general loss functions. OK, so uh, the algorithm for p equals 1. Um, so for a matrix A, let's define its v norm. Uh, v stands for vertical. We take the two norm of each of the rows and we add them up. OK. And um, since we're looking at p equals 1, uh, the low rank approximation question is just to find a, uh, a k-dimensional space v so that the v norm of a minus a v v transpose is at most 1 plus epsilon times the optimal cost, where you minimize over all k-dimensional spaces. OK? And so our strategy uh, for doing this um, is as follows. So what we're going to try to do is find um, what I call squashing matrices. So we're going to find matrices R and C. R is a very wide fat matrix. So a, a small number of rows, poly k over epsilon, but n columns. And C is a very tall, thin matrix. Okay. So it has d rows and poly k over epsilon uh, columns. We're also going to try to find uh, a matrix U, a d by poly k over epsilon matrix with orthonormal columns. And you should think of this as being our bi criteria, I mean, our, um, our weak core set. OK, so U, somehow we're going to find a U which contains a good k dimensional space in its column span. 
And then the point is, <coughs> we're going to apply these squashing matrices R and C to the matrix A U X U transpose minus A, where X um, is a small matrix. So U is D by poly K epsilon. So X is poly K epsilon by poly K epsilon. OK, it's, it's a fa fairly small matrix. And um, what you can think of this as being is uh, if, if X is a uh, projection matrix onto a k-dimensional space inside of U, then U X U transpose is just the projection onto this k-dimensional space. Right, so I, I project into U and then I project onto k, uh, onto this k-dimensional space X, okay? So if we found a good um, weak core set U, then actually if we minimize over k-dimensional projectors X, this will be a one plus epsilon approximation. Does it make sense? Like all I'm saying is, um, you know, suppose somehow someone gave us a weak core set U. We know there's a good k-dimensional space inside of there. So if we minimize over X, you know, this will be rank K. If we minimize over rank KX, this will be rank K. And so this, the V norm of this difference will be small. Okay. But it's a big problem, right? It's, I mean, these are N by D, this is an N by D matrix. We don't like big problems, so we, we, we squash them with R and C. And suppose we could find R and C, which preserve the cost for any X. Then we would have a small problem. So we take this matrix, and what we're doing now is we're just multiplying on the left by R and on the right by C, and then minimizing the V norm of that thing. Suppose we could find these squashing matrices R and C, then now we have a small problem, and we just try to find the optimal x for this problem. Now, now why do we, um, and, and so at the end of the day, this u x u transpose will be your output, the k-dimensional, the projection onto a k-dimensional space, which gives you a one plus epsilon approximation. Okay, so why, why do we want to find, find a small problem? Okay, so if this is a small enough problem, then we can actually solve it using generic methods. Okay? We can just write it as a system of polynomial inequalities and solve this using polynomial optimization techniques. Okay? So um, here's a one form of polynomial optimization uh, over the reals. Suppose you're given uh, C polynomial inequalities each of degree at most D in M variables. Okay, so we have polynomial one, P1, X1 through XM is greater than beta one, etc. Polynomial PC of X1 through XM is greater than beta C. And you want to know, is there an assignment of the variables for which all these inequalities uh, hold? So you can solve this problem in time, which is in the base of this, it's uh, number of inequalities C times the degree D to the order M, the number of variables. Okay, this is, um, this form of the theorem is due to uh, Basu, Pollock, and Roy, um, based on work on um, uh, existential theory of the reals. And um, what's important to notice about this, though, is if the number of variables M uh, is small, then this is reasonably efficient. And so this was sort of the point of reducing this problem to a small problem. Okay, so x, we, we can create variables for each entry in x. X is uh, mapping, I mean, x is a poly k over epsilon by poly k over epsilon matrix of rank k. It has a small number of entries. Um, we need this to be a small problem, the number of rows and the number of columns to be small, because we actually need to create sign variables for, for each of the entries as well. But in total, we can create a small number of variables, poly k over epsilon, and then just using this generic theorem, we can uh, solve this problem uh, in exponential uh, in that time, poly k over epsilon. Um, 
There are some technicalities. Uh, you need to do a binary search. So you need a lower bound on the cost, given that it's non-zero. These can be uh, dealt with. OK, so our strategy is to reduce this to a small problem. Um, yeah, so, so how do we do this? So what's way, one way of reducing the size of matrices? I mean, um, so what you'll see is uh, we're going to use uh, sketching to do this. Um, but for, first, let me go through uh, some steps here. So um, the first thing I mentioned is you should think of U as being a, a weak core set. Okay, so it's, its column span contains a good k-dimensional space. Suppose we could find such a U. Then as I mentioned, the projection onto uh, the k-dimensional space that we care about can be written as U x U transpose, where x has rank k. OK? And so once we have a weak core set, we've already reduced the original problem to this optimization problem. OK? We're just trying to find this x here, uh, which minimizes this v norm. And the second part, so there are two parts of the algorithm, finding the weak core set and finding these small squashing matrices R and C, and then just running a generic polynomial optimization solver. Yeah, so the small matrices, as I said, the property that you want is if you left multiply by R and right multiply by C and then solve the small problem to get some X prime, if you plug it back into the original problem, then uh, it's a 1 plus epsilon approximation. OK. So um, those are the two steps. A key tool actually uh, underlying both of these steps is uh, what I call sketching matrices for the v-norm. Um, so consider uh, the following problem. Um, what you'd like to do is you're given a matrix B, which has uh, some rank R, which th you should think of as being small. And you're given a matrix A, and you're trying to find an x which minimizes the v-norm of xB minus A. OK, so does this problem look like something? Uh, what is, uh, does this problem look like something that you're familiar with? Um, so what if I, so, so let's look at the optimal x for this problem. We can actually solve this problem by just solving for each of the rows of x independently. Why? Because the v norm, what it does is it adds the two norms of each of the rows. So we can solve this problem by solving each row independently. What is, what is the problem that you get by solving one of these rows? Exactly. It's linear regression. So um, the rows xi in the optimal x can be solved via n regression problems, least squares regression. OK. Um, but we're actually going to need to uh, be able to solve this uh, fairly quickly. Um, and uh, to do this, we're going to use uh, subspace embeddings. OK? So here's a, a technique for solving regression, um, uh, which I think uh, Jelani will talk about uh, more later in, uh, in the week. So what it is is the following. What you're going to do is take this regression problem, and instead of solving it, you're going to write multiply by a random matrix, which uh, significantly reduces uh, the number of columns. OK? So the statement is, the f is as follows. There are d by poly r over epsilon uh, random matrices S, which have a subspace embedding property. Simultaneously, for all vectors x, the um, Euclidean distance um, between uh, um, x, b, s, minus a, i, s is 1 plus or minus epsilon, the Euclidean distance between x, b, and a, i. OK? So S uh, basically preserves the entire uh, space of solutions, X. So if you have this property, you can just write multiply by S, 
and then solve the regression problem. Does that make sense? Any solution you get here will be a 1 plus epsilon approximation to the original problem. Now, the probability of these things succeeding, um, so it's at least 1 minus a polynomial and epsilon over r. So the, the natural question here is which random matrices work? So one natural family of matrices that works is a family of IID Gaussian matrices. Um, if you want faster time complexity, you can use uh, randomized FFT, or subsampled uh, randomized Hadamard transform, uh, as observed by Sarlos uh, for regression. And if you want even faster computation, um, you can let S be a so-called count sketch matrix. OK? Um, and we actually need this uh, in our algorithm. So um, let me just say uh, what the count sketch matrix is, if you haven't seen it before. So, um, so it's a random D by poly R over epsilon matrix. And the nice thing about it, if you look at it, is it's ex extremely sparse. OK? So there's only a single non-zero entry per row. This non-zero entry is chosen at a uniformly random location, independently for the rows. And on that location, it's 1 with probability 1, 1 half, and minus 1 with probability 1 half. OK, so the nice thing about S is that actually you can compute matrix uh, products. You can compute the product of it with a matrix very quickly. OK, so given a matrix B, you can compute B times S in time proportional to the number of non-zero entries of B. And uh, what you can show is that um, uh, what, what we showed and what was refined uh, by uh, work that I mentioned earlier is that uh, simultaneously for all x, you can preserve um, the, uh, the distance. Uh, so if, um, for all vectors x times b, you have that the Euclidean distance between xbs and ais is 1 plus or minus epsilon the Euclidean distance between xb and ai. Yeah, so the number of uh, columns of s depends on the rank of b. This holds for an arbitrary b. So if b has rank r, this is my number of, uh, uh, of columns. Yeah, there's no assumption on condition number or anything like that. Um, OK, so this allows, yeah, if you haven't seen this before, this allows for solving least squares regression very quickly. The leading order term is proportional to the number of non-zero entries of the matrix. Um, so let me just say, go back to what we're trying to do here, which is uh, sketching for the v-norm. Um, so this is the sort of regression problem that we want to solve. But unlike typical regression, it's, it's uh, sum of Euclidean uh, distances as opposed to sum of squared Euclidean distances. And uh, as we said, we can solve for each of the rows of x independently via regression. So why don't we just do what we just said? So we choose a random matrix S, which is this count sketch matrix, and uh, we apply it on the right. And then we just solve regression n times. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So basically, you know, this is applying S for each of the n uh, regression problems written in matrix language. Can we do this? So it turns out that, um, I mean, of course, you, you can do it, but we actually can't do it for our algorithm. The reason is that for this, um, uh, suppose I'm trying to solve these n regression problems, then I have some probability of failure for each of the n regression problems. Okay, so maybe uh, you know maybe what I can do is uh, union bound over the n regression problems, and you can, but if you do that, the number of rows of S will be at least log n times some poly R over epsilon. OK, is there any reason that might be bad? I mean, what, does anyone care about log n factors? Well, the thing is that actually we're going to plug this into a polynomial system solver. 
And in some sense, the dimension of s is going to be related to the number of variables in this polynomial system solver. And this is a major problem if there's a log n here. We'll get some time complexity, which is like n to the, you know, some function of r and epsilon. <coughs> so this actually doesn't work. Um, uh, so one thing that we prove is uh, a, a new uh, structural lemma, which shows how to get rid of this log n factor. Um, so it, it's not going to be a subspace embedding, but it's sufficient for a regression. In some sense, you can think of it as a lopsided subspace embedding. It doesn't allow uh, any vectors to contract too much, and the optimum vector doesn't dilate that much. And this is sufficient for a minimization problem. So the lemma is, is as follows. If S is a D by poly R over epsilon count sketch matrix, no log n here, then with probability at least a constant for any given fixed matrix B of rank R and any n by D matrix A, if you sketch on the right by this matrix, count sketch matrix S, and solve the regression problem in the sketch space, getting some matrix X prime, if you plug it back into the original reg uh, regression problem, it's a 1 plus epsilon approximation. OK? So this is dimension free. It doesn't depend on the number n of uh, rows. Um, and this is different than existing things that look at some of squares of regression costs. And um, as I said, we need this lemma in several places. Uh, to get a weak core set and also to find these squashing matrices R and C. I unfortunately don't have time to get into those details. Um, the lemma is, is actually very general in that it um, generalizes to sum of M estimators. OK, so instead of just taking sum of Euclidean distances, I can also apply count sketch and actually take sum of uh, uh, M estimators applied to the, uh, to the distances. Um, OK, so th yeah, this is a structural lemma. But um, let me just uh, conclude here. Uh, I'm almost out of time. So let me just state the results again. So we can get um, an input sparsity time algorithm for robust low rank approximation with this cost measure. OK, sum of pth powers of distances. And it generalizes to give the first near input sparsity time algorithms for a wide class of M estimators. Um, we show the first hardness results. So for p uh, equals 1, for example, we show that there's no polynomial time algorithm in all of the parameters um, unless p equals np. And uh, let me just mention one other thing is that uh, using the techniques in this paper, we're able to actually um, solve regression for a wider class of m estimators than what was previously known. Uh, so we had previous work that this uh, improves upon. Um, let me just stop there. So, thanks. Yeah. 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 So I'm really sorry. I didn't. Ha yeah, have time to get into any of these details. Yeah. So you actually use, um, you can actually use some of your work. I mean, so you basically, uh, you sketch on one side. Um, and then what happens is you have a, a V norm, which you can translate into an L1 norm. Uh, one way of doing that is, um, uh, or you can just, uh, so, so you know this sampling algorithms for L1 regression? This is how you get the sketching matrix on the left. And it also works for some of Euclidean distances, not just some of L1 distances. And so the matrix on the right is from this structural lemma. And the matrix on the left is this uh, uh, the sampling uh, for L1 regression. But actually, that sampling for L1 regression, it doesn't give you a 1 plus epsilon approximation. Because um, in L1 regression, uh, if you have a matrix A and a vector B, it'll give you 1 plus epsilon approximation. But if you have a matrix A and a matrix B, the number of samples depends on how big this matrix B is. So uh, you actually get a sort of a constant factor approximation, and then you, um, you sort of bootstrap from there. Uh, but I can talk to you more about this offline. Uh, yeah. <laughs>